Universa is in the business of providing what you call explosive like insurance strategies. Might also call it catastrophe insurance, right? They are designed to be money makers in and of themselves, but I'm wondering, given what we saw happen in the fourth quarter, did those strategies, given the drawdown in the market in the fourth quarter, did those strategies pay off handsomely? You know, I could never get into the particulars, of course. I'm not asking you for specific returns. Um, you know, it, was a, it, it remains a very complacent environment. You know, the way I see uh, what happened in that, that fourth quarter, um, you know, the, 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 the market was very much calling uh, the Fed's bluff, uh, and the, the Fed, of course, folded. Um, and, you know, it, it was, a, it, it was a, a very inconsistent type of a sell-off, and, and, and I would say that the complacency certainly, even during that environment, remained, and it very much is back to um, the high today. So, you know, I've been saying this a long time. I, uh, I don't think that the, the Fed is ever going to be able to normalize uh, rates, um, and I think that the market was making a huge mistake in thinking that um, the central banks are going to crash this market. The markets will, will crash, but it won't be because of anything that the central banks do, in, in my opinion. What will it be because of? Well, you know, there's this uh, term, it's an Austrian economics term called creative destruction. It's, mm -hmm. uh, Sean Pater called it the, mm -hmm. the sort of uh, central fact, essential fact about capitalism. And, you know, we still live in sort of this pseudo-capitalism today, and we still have this, uh, this notion of, of creative destruction, but it's very different. It's, it's very concentrated in time. Creative destruction is about one business plan destroying another, you know, the auto industry destroying the horse and, and buggy industry. Uh, but, but what happens now is think of the business plans that are alive today that grew in the last 10 years simply because of the interventionism uh, in the monetary system. Um, you know, we've got three trillion in balance sheet here and we've got almost five some trillion in corporate debt that has been built up. This has gone specifically into business plans that survive and that make sense only because of the interest rate environment, only because of the monetary environment. So when that changes, it's, a, it's an, enormous, uh, an enormous problem. And this is really what recessions are. This is really what crashes are at the end of the day. So it'll happen on its own, um, very much on its own. The debt on its own uh, will, will very much do it. You know, I think we forget that um, this Fed balance sheet, the central bank balance sheet, and the money that's printed, at the end of the day, is not, it's, it's, it's a fiat money. It's not wealth. We, we forget that. This is not wealth that's been created. Um, it's a liability that's been created. And liabilities, of course, need to get paid off. It doesn't matter what the interest rate is. So that creates natural uh, uh, assertion. I'm going to ask you what, what, what may sound like a bit of a crazy question, but when you said the automobile destroyed the horse and buggy business, that's, of course, true. Will, it's a question of the moment, and I'm not channeling anything personally here, but will progressive liberalism destroy capitalism? Uh, well, pro the pro pro progressive liberalism, uh, well, this, that's a euphemism. Wow. <laughs> um, well, it, um, uh, could it destroy capitalism? In the short run, it could. I mean, I'm very optimistic in the very, very long run. This is beyond my lifetime, but it certainly could. There's, there are things about capitalism that, that inherently um, 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 cause it to destroy itself. And this is not because it's not the most efficient and effective system, but because um, um, there are things, uh, uh, sort of more optics about it that, that people don't like. Do you subscribe to the notion that capitalism may not be the best system, it's just better than any other system? Um, sure, but I do think it's the best system. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's a natural system. There are things we don't like about evolution. There are things we don't like about natural systems that have this creative destruction. Um, but it is the best, most optimal system. Last time you were here, we talked about the modern financial system and this point that you're inherently making now that that monetary interventions in some res respect doom us to a never-ending cycle of bubbles and busts. Now I want to talk about another modern thing, modern portfolio theory, and this has come up in our conversations as well. You're not a big believer in modern portfolio theory. Why? Um, modern portfolio theory fails to put the correct emphasis on what matters. And what matters at the end of the day is the extreme loss. We, 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 what we do as portfolio managers, as investors, is try to maximize our rate of compounding over time. And when you do that, what matters is the big loss. It's not the volatility. It's not the, sh the sort of smaller um, ebb and flows uh, in your, in your P&L. 
just think of it this way if you, if you, don't, if you don't believe me. If you lose 50% one year, it takes almost two years of plus 50% positive mm -hmm. returns in order to get back to, to zero. But that would be a nice return. Negative People live plus. through that in they do. to 010. They do, but Good. modern portfolio theory doesn't understand risk mitigation as we talk about it today doesn't understand that and doesn't uh, 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 try to uh, 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 emphasize, doesn't try to correct that. Modern portfolio theory led to portfolio construction. Portfolio construction is the foundation for what most of the biggest and most sophisticated institutional investors around the world do. They're all wrong. Well, the problem is, you know, people think that risk mitigation is about raising your returns relative to your risk. Getting to the efficient frontier, right? Right, right. So we're sort of in this sharp space. I mean, you can't eat sharp ratios. What matters is compounding. <laughs> um, and when you compound, geometric returns look very different than arithmetic returns. We sort of focus on this, this, this arithmetic space, but it's the big losses that affect your geometric compounding. That's really all that matters. Do you believe in alpha, excess return? Um, yeah, there are certainly inefficiencies, tremendous inefficiencies mm -hmm. in the market. There's, there's no but question about But is it possible that. for any one person or any one group of people to capture those inefficiencies consistently over time? In other words, we know about John Paulson, right, betting on the subprime mortgage trade and making billions of dollars once and not being able to replicate anything nearly like that. In fact, for the most part, losing money ever since the financial crisis. Yeah, I think it is. I don't think it's possible for 10,000 hedge funds or people to. Um, you know, there's definitely a game being played there. Being played there, and it has to do with negative skewness. If you have a negatively skewed returns, it's very easy to look like you have positive alpha for a very long time. But no, I'm not. I mean, certainly there are tremendous inefficiencies, and there are people who have niche uh, have a niche in, uh, in, in in cap monetizing these. So, if you again looking at the hedge fund industry. No, in your view, not possible for 10,000 hedge funds to generate alpha. Any ideas to how many is the right number? Uh, it's, it's a low number, for sure. But remember, the hedge fund industry isn't just about alpha, really. It is about risk mitigation. People will take on a hedge fund with very low returns. Doing because, some of the stuff that you're doing. Uh, um, no, not necessarily. Not really, because it's very, there's, there's, you could go for risk mitigation through low correlation or even just a negative correlation. Mm -hmm. but of course, what I do is, is, is massively negative conditional correlation in a crash. So it's, these are very different things. What do you think is better in principle? The kind of risk mitigation that you just talked about that maybe some of the more successful hedge fund, hedge fund managers are able to execute or the kind of approach that your product, if you will, facilitates, which is taking more risk, if you will, a barbell-like strategy, a strategy, you know, a, a approach, strategies that take a lot of risk and try to generate a lot of return, and another strategy on the other end that provides the cat catastrophe insurance, you know, when the disaster strikes. The only thing that will move the needle for you from a risk mitigation standpoint, and when I say move the needle, it means lowering your risk, and in lowering your risk, raising your long run rate of compounding. The only thing that will move the needle for you is an explosive downside payoff. You know, if you own an asset today that um, you can't afford to take a large loss on, you, you have two choices. One is to own less of it, and the other is to own insurance on it. There's no middle ground. There's something that's going to make you a little bit um, when you lose a lot on it. Um, and so th this is a fundamental th idea today, and it's something that, you know, model portfolio theory and certainly risk mitigation as it's done today is not, is not doing. You know, the worst thing that you could do is rather than a type one error, which is just to have no insurance or have no real risk mitigation, far worse than that is a type two error where you think you have insurance, you think you have protection, but in fact you don't. So this is something that I think people need to be um, cognizant of. I know you're loath to talk about how you build an insurance-like strategy, but I am curious about this. I can understand in principle how it is, I'll use the word easy to build such a portfolio or easier in times when prices are rising because volatility is low and tail risk protection in theory anyway is cheap when you're buying put-like instruments. What happens when the market is falling and the cost of vol protection and risk mitigation goes up? Well. Of course, we saw this. Uh, we see this through every crisis, and we and we saw an episode. Yeah. I think, yeah. even though you described some complacently, complacency, there was some of that in the fourth quarter. Yeah. So th this uh, th this question you ask is something that's central to me as an investor. This is really what I care about: is the cost of me doing this, my ability to continue to do this. So the the, the convenient thing for me is that in the environments 
um, when uh, I'm sort of priced out of the market, that's typically followed by some type of spike uh, where you know, typically I will provide uh, um, uh, that sort of insurance payout, if you will. So they, they tend to go together in many ways. So if, 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 my, if, if I'm not going to get that spike in, a, in some type of smaller move, typically the complacency is still there. If the complacency is gone, usually it involves some type of payout. And so if we're in a protracted period of market decline, haven't seen one of those for a long time, you just step to the sidelines? A protracted period of slow decline? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's, it's hard to find these. You know, it's really 1970s hard. 1970s was, I think, the last time, right? We, the market definitely crashed in the 70s. So that, I don't think anyone would, would call the 70s a, a, a slow drip, drip decline. So, yeah, and in fact, I think the 70s are good, is, is a good way to think about um, what we're staring at here. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find these. There is a sort of a universal, this is a universal feature of markets in that they have very fat love tails. They tend to boom and bust.